Welcome to my latest para documentary, which actually starts in the village of Canoodon in Essex. Why Canoodon? I'm hoping to focus upon the ghostly legends associated with this church, the Church of St Nicholas, and also its nefarious reputation for witchcraft, and to examine more closely in detail the background and origins of some of the legends attached to the church, which, if to be believed, would make Canoodon one of the most actively witchcraft-infested areas in the entire world. But of course, as one knows through life, that quite often, once you've separated truth from fiction, the true reality of these places is nothing more different than perhaps to other locations within the county of Essex and elsewhere. And of course, I'm hoping to examine them in much more detail. But firstly, let's look at the church here of St Nicholas. It is of late medieval origin, and this magnificent tower, which stands on a hill promontory, rises 123 feet above sea level and gives unparalleled views across the valley. And certainly, perhaps through history, it may have been used as a possible defensive position, and more certainly as a lookout. And the tower was constructed as celebration for the English victory over the French following the Battle of Agincourt in the year 1415. And certainly today, the tower can be seen from many locations at great distances as you approach this area. And it's, uh, shall we say, quite a landmark which most people, and particularly so boats using the nearby river, have used as a navigable feature. The actual origins of the name Canoodon dates back to Saxon times and means basically Hill of Canna's people. Certainly King Canute, on his campaigns across England, had a base camp nearby and may well have used this promontory as it afforded such a good view across the neighbouring valleys and hills. But firstly let's deal with why I'm here. I'm hoping to, after I visited the village of Canoodon, to travel over to Felstead in Essex, which has a personal association with me, perhaps with a possible witch and witchcraft, and to the village of Manitry and Missley in Essex, which was the home base of Matthew Hopkins' self-styled Witchfinder General in the 17th century, who, during his time, dispensed, or should we say serial murdered, with his assistant, Mr Stern, over 300 innocent women. But let's firstly look at the alleged reputation for witchcraft associated with this church and the village. If we examine the court records and testimonials of actual witchcraft trials here in the village of Canoodon, we have to look firstly in the year 1585, when a local spinster by the name of Rose Pye appeared before the court here, accused of bewitching to death a 12-month-old baby by the name of Joanna Snow, who lived at nearby Scaldhurst Farm. On this occasion, the court showed leniency because the evidence to convict was insufficient. But by a cruel twist of fate, although she was acquitted, she actually died in prison because she was unable to pay her release fee. And sadly, five years later, a lady by the name of Cicely Makin, or Good Wife Makin, appeared before the court here, charged with practicing witchcraft. Here, of course, on this occasion, they showed a degree of leniency. They gave her five years to mend her ways and to return back to the teachings of Christ. Suffice to say that five years following, she was back again before the same court where, instead of being executed or being imprisoned or tortured, on this occasion, by modern standards, they showed a degree of leniency because she was excommunicated from the church. But by the standards of medieval England, that meant her soul was going to be consigned to hell. As Cicely Macon was obviously a practicing Wiccan, that wasn't much of a threat, and as far as we're aware, from that period onwards, she was able to live her life out peaceably. 
After these two trials in Canoodon, there appears to be no further records indicating that any other citizens of this village were brought to trial accused of witchcraft, which of course cannot be said for other parts of England, and particularly in this county of Essex and Suffolk, where witchcraft was considered to be quite a prevalent and common offence. But what Canoodon is particularly known for are its legends associated with witchcraft and the rituals of witchcraft that are connected to this village and, of course, to this church. One of the most interesting characters that could be connected to the village of Canoodon was a man by the name of George Pickingill, who was born in 1813 and died in the village in the year 1909. And it's believed that he's buried somewhere in the churchyard but without a headstone. George was known as a cunning man. Cunning in this case meant that he was a witch and had practiced his worship to a horn god, allegedly. And during his lifetime, although employed as a farm worker, many people used to go to him for cures, for many ailments and warts, and also to improve crops and so on and so forth which he could give some kind of potion or make some kind of spell. It is said that he walked along a hedgerow and touched it with a stick. All the animals in the hedgerow would run out and they could easily be captured and caught for gain. It was also said that if anyone crossed swords with George, their life and indeed their prosperity in life could be severely hampered by what George could do in the manner of witches and spells. The problem with the legend of George Pickingill is that despite all these grand claims that are added to his reputation, most of those were actually discovered, as it were, some 50 years after his death by the writer Eric Maple, who went around many old age people's homes interviewing some of the elderly residents to get their take upon the legend of George Pickingill. And of course, as one gets older, one's memory tends to fade. And certainly in this case, his reputation was, she would say, somewhat elaborated by those that he spoke to. It was said that if you went to his cottage just on the outskirts of the village and looked through the window during the evening time, you could see his familiars in the form of mice suckling at his nipples and all manner of weird and wonderful cows associated with this man were researched by this writer of folklore, Eric Maple. And of course, going further into, I believe, the 1970s, an American by the name of Lefeb also added more to the reputation of George Pickingale. And so, as a witch and as a cunning man, he somehow shone out from all of the other witches that are recorded and known who were operating within the county of Essex. But George Pickinger was no fool and he was also a person that um, liked to rewrite the rituals of his worship to witchcraft, the horn god, and was also a man who was known to make some fairly grand statements. For example, he claimed that he had nine covens across the county of Essex and I also believe in neighbouring counties such as Hertfordshire. And that on one occasion he had a showdown with another witch where he struck this witch down dead with his magic. And of course all this added to his reputation as a man to be feared. And certainly the villagers and indeed the church did fear him regardless. He claimed that he could sit quietly smoking a pipe while he would employ imps to bring in the crops from the farmer's field and that farmers would pay him extra money to be able to perform these miracles on their behalf. Another reputation added to the legend of Alistair Crowley, for example, was that he was at one time a disciple of George Pickingill and that he was eventually thrown out from the sect for his behaviour which was considered to be outside their teachings and practices. However, 
further research in later years by other researchers can find no evidence of any connection between Alistair Crowley and George Piggingill. And yet we can prove here that in later years people have added more to the legend of George Piggingill, which today has given rise to the fact that Canoodon is regarded as the focal point of witchcraft in the county of Essex. And indeed, if one needs further proof that the reputation of witchcraft in Canoodon was a concoction of the 19th century, there's a local rhyme which says that there will always be six witches in the village, three of cotton and three of silk. Well, if that had been something which was claimed to be a medieval saying, then surely it would not have been cotton, it would have been wool. Cotton was a discovery of the 19th century, and certainly during the era of George Pickingill. Without going into more detail about his magical claims and what he could do and what he could not do and his victims, it was quite clear that he had a grudge against the church and had many times had run-ins with the local priest. It is claimed that when he died he was walking through the churchyard at Canoodon when at night daylight suddenly appeared from behind a cross, a stone cross in the cemetery which reflected upon him and struck him dead. Nothing could be further than the truth. He actually fell ill at home and he was taken to a hospice but eventually he died of old age and was subsequently buried in the churchyard. Certainly there are many, many legends and attachments between the church and its association with witchcraft. It is alleged that should a stone fall from the tower of the church, it would indicate that one of the six witches inside the village had died and that another was due to take their place. And still adding to the legend of the tower and the witches, that so long as the church tower stands, there will always be witches in the village. Apparently, anyone who walks around the tower at midnight could be forced to dance with witches. And apparently at Halloween, if you go around the tower seven times, you will see a witch. Thirteen times, you will become invisible. If you run around the tower anti-clockwise on Halloween, the devil will apparently appear before you. And more interestingly, if you run around the tower backwards three times, a portal will appear before you and you'll be able to travel back through time. Now, of course, I have yet to find any reference to any person that has claimed to have experienced any of these experiences inside the churchyard at Canoodon. And again, it's something that people have welded to the legend of George Pickingill and to witches inside the village, which has made it such a fascinating place for study and particularly for folklore and local anecdotes. I certainly don't feel that Canoodon is perhaps any more haunted with witches or infested with witches, whichever way you want to look at it, than anywhere else in the country. But what I find particularly intriguing about the whole deal is that if we go back to the 17th century, we have the witch finder General Matthew Hopkins persecuting innocent people, accusing them of being witches. And in the 19th century, we have George Pickingill doing exactly the reverse, but this time on church members of the local congregation. A certain irony, perhaps, and one which, of course, has stuck quite firmly in my mind since I started to research this particular documentary. I find these legends and local anecdotes to be fascinating, but by and large, I regard them as just that, anecdotes and stories, nothing more. But they do add a rich character to the fabric of what the village of Canoodon is to this day. And sadly, because of it, it attracts a lot of people there at night, and the church had been forced to add security gates to prevent people from entering at night. And it is also fair to say that some people have gone into the churchyard and have seriously damaged headstones, because on one portion of the churchyard, the cemetery, it is absolutely devoid of any headstones, which have been ripped up and smashed up in the past 
which perhaps is a tragedy to the history of the village and our knowledge of the past. Apart from the church and the village's association with witchcraft, the church has two notable ghostly legends attached to it. The most notorious has been seen on a number of occasions. A lady wearing a poke bonnet hat who has no face, who has been seen to pass through the west gate in the car park at the front of the church and disappear down before the river. And on one night, a lady was parked outside who had no knowledge of its ghostly reputations. When she saw this apparition, she saw that it had no facial features. She was petrified and she fled in flight from this sighting and never to return again to the church. And no doubt today, probably to recall that situation with horror and fear of what happened to her on that particular night. But apart from that, there's also been an alleged headless ghost seen inside the churchyard who has been known to deposit these victims in neighbouring ditches. Quite how true any of these legends are, one can only conjecturise. But I would have thought that the occasion of the lady who saw the figure with a poke bonnet face is probably one of the more truthful elements attached to any of the ghostly sightings here. But what is more particularly worrying and frightening for any visitors to this churchyard are its associations with witches and some of the rituals which have been seen and performed inside this very active churchyard. I'm actually standing outside this rather delightful timber frame building in the village of Felstead in Essex, which, as you can see, was built by George Boot in the year 1596. Certainly today it stands out as an interesting feature, and particularly so when it's opposite the Guild Hall and the beautiful church here. And of course, Felstead is noted for its public school. But coming back to this building, it also has an addition which you don't find on any other buildings in this area and that is known locally as the Felstead Hang and allegedly depicts, according to the builder, a carving of his wife. She being a rather plain and ugly woman, he decided to display that more as a joke rather than with reference to anything else. But if you look more closely at this figure, which is actually a support bracket, you'll notice that she has cloven feet and she also has exposed breasts and appears to be restrained or held back and contained on the side of the building. I think the truth here is that the figure was carved as a grotesque to ward off evil. We have only got to go back three years earlier in the year 1593 when a local spinster at the age of 59 years, a, a woman by the name of Alice Albert, was declared to be a witch. According to a local farmer, she had hexed a number of his animals which fell ill and died. And she apparently had bewitched them. And in order to gain retribution against her, he complained to the local magistrate here who issued a warrant for her arrest 
and she was taken to Chelmsford Assizes where, along with a number of other innocent women, she was judged guilty of witchcraft and she was hung. One can also imagine that she was probably tortured at great length where under torture, under pressure, she may have admitted to anything at all. But there the story doesn't quite end. And this is where I come into the picture. A few years ago, I came to this village to shoot a piece on George Boot House and some of the other buildings and the church. And as I was carrying my camera across the road to get a better view of George Boot House, I was standing in a central position, as you can see from this short clip here, when I recorded the most unusual EVP. If you listen closely, the background audio is completely wiped out and it's substituted by this very evil sounding voice. A number of voice analysts have listened to this at length and have declared that they can find no logical or reasonable explanation for that voice to be there. And so I think it's fair to say and most certain to say that that is EVP or electronic voice phenomena which was inadvertently recorded by me as I carried the camera across the road. Could there be an association between that EVP, the legend of George Boot House and the poor spinster Alice Albert? And of course today I can't answer that question. I can only surmise that there may be a tenuous connection. Perhaps many centuries ago when George Boot built this beautiful house that Alice Albert had lived very local to where the restaurant is today. And perhaps Alice Albert's spirit still reigns supreme in this part of the village of Felstead. As I said, I'm only speculating, it's just idle speculation, uh, only from what I rec recovered on camera. Certainly a strange place to record EVP in the middle of a busy road, but it happened and so did of course the legend of Alice Albert and the Felsted Hag which today still intrigues and fascinates many tourists that come to this area and so now we move on to another area much noted with witchcraft but in later years in fact in the 17th century The final part of my documentary on Essex witches actually brings me to the villages of Missley and Manningtree. In fact, I'm standing within the grounds of Missley Towers, which was subject of a separate visit and investigation, which is linked here below. Manningtree and Missley will always be connected with one man, the nemesis of all witches in the 17th century a man by the name of Matthew Hopkins, the son of a Puritan priest who was born in Great Wenham in Suffolk in the year 1620 and following the death of his father, who was quite a wealthy man, owning tenements at Framlingham Castle in Suffolk, he came to this area with a hundred marks as part of his father's will where he purchased the Misley Fawn Hotel. Today there is still a Misley Fawn Hotel but unfortunately it's not the original building that Hopkins purchased. It was torn down much earlier and a later version was built in the year 1735. Whilst here he came across an alleged witchcraft trial that was being prosecuted at the behest of villagers by a man of the name of John Stern. He actually appeared at the trial and listened to how Stern presented his evidence and obviously at that point decided 
to throw his lot in with Stern to carry out their own investigations into witchcraft because it was painfully obvious that people were willing to pay for the death of other people. And before long, they had actually formed a company which involved three professional witch identifiers. These were women who knew the signs of a witch and Stern employed as a witch pricker. They were certainly psychopaths. They had no feelings or remorse for their victims and they were handsomely rewarded, not only to dispose of alleged witches by identifying them, but also innocents that other people were prepared to pay good sums of cash for to be rid of them. In fact, by the end of his reign, he had accrued the princely sum of a thousand pounds, which by modern standards would place him within a level close to being a millionaire. So it was certainly a very, very profitable exercise. And the sad part about all of this was the fact that this occurred during the English Civil War. So there was no proper lawful jurisdiction by authorities because some could be under the control of the royalists, others could be under the control of the parliamentarians. And so Hopkins was able to work within this grey area and he even had a letter of good conduct to allow him through two different areas in order to carry out his alleged persecutions of witches. It is believed by the end of his reign that he had murdered over 300 women and also some men too and on one occasion had persecuted an elderly priest who he accused of being a witch. Quite clearly Hopkins had gone beyond his remit as a witch finder general and was a psychopath completely out of control. Now why would people want somebody persecuted as a witch? Well, most of his victims were poor, painless, elderly widows, easy victims to torture and to confess to alleged crimes. And as a result of their prosecution, they would receive a financial settlement from the grateful villagers. And the reasons behind all of this mostly were the fact that the Great Plague existed during that period of history. And of course, there were a number of ailments and diseases affecting livestock which all could be attributed to the work of a witch. Nobody really understood the mechanics of science at that period of history. It was still very much in its infancy and particularly with medicine. And so if somebody fell sick or if their animals fell ill, it had to be the work of a witch. Of course, there is no testimony following any of these persecutions that any of these animals or people recovered from their alleged ailments as a result of a witch being persecuted and tried. And certainly during their early days here in Missley and Manningtree, they prosecuted and had hung 19 women from this area who were completely innocent of any crime of witchcraft. In fact, during the early days, in the year 1645, most of their early victims were tried by water at the infamous Hopping Bridge, which can still be seen today along the walls at Missley. And here, victims were tied to chairs and thrown over the side into the pond below. If they died, they were clearly innocent, but if they floated back to the surface, they were obviously guilty as a witch, and they were later taken to Colchester where they were tried and hung. And indeed today in the castle basement are the remains of the cells in which a number of these poor women were incarcerated. But it can be considered that they would have been cold, they would have been damp, and the victims would have been stripped naked and beaten. Other methods to detect witches could be signs of a witch, particularly if people have warts or moles. These are normally signs of witches, apparently. Or if people have an extra nipple, which is definitely the mark of the devil, and so on and so forth. I, in fact, have a birthmark on my back, which quite clearly could indicate that I'm a witch, because if you look at this birthmark, it actually resembles a witch on the broomstick. So had I lived, in the 17th century and was wrongly and falsely accused of being a witch, I would not legally have been able to defend myself. Such was the savagery and the bigotry of that period of history. Methods they employed to extract confessions and to prove their guilt, that was simply by using a blunt knife placed against their arms, and of course a blunt knife would not cut their skin and would not draw blood, which was a sure sign of witchcraft, 
or by using a knife with a retractable blade so that the knife will appear to pass through the victim's arm and be retracted with no trace of any blood or indeed any cuts to the skin, which was also a sure sign of witchcraft. It's believed that Hopkins drew his inspiration from the works of King James I, who wrote a book on demonology. It is also suggested that for a period, he was employed as a clerk in Holland, where he learned much of the continental methods of detecting witches. All bar one of his victims were hung. Only one was burnt at the stake, whereas that practice of burning at the stake of witches was fairly commonplace throughout Europe. One of the questions that arises is why didn't Hopkins visit Canoodon in Essex? And the suggestion is that he was too terrified of the witches there. Well, as I've shown in the earlier part of my documentary, the alleged witchcraft in the village was more a confection of the 19th century and he had no reason or call to go there and I'm fairly sure that someone like Hopkins would not easily be dissuaded from attending a village which was noted to be haunted with witches. It is interesting to note that Hopkins produced in the year 1647 the discovery of witches which he used in his defence against the priest John Gore at Great Staunton in Huntingdonshire, who denounced him as a witch. Huntingdon was perhaps his last final battle, and he was forced to retreat, and suffering from an illness of a chest infection, he went back to his home in Manningtree in South Street, which in fact today is an empty lot next to the Red Line public house, where he died of his illness. Within hours, Hopkins had been buried in the grounds of Misley Church, not this churchyard, but another church which sadly no longer exists today, and so we are unable to place exactly where Hopkins is interred. But suffice to say that his legacy lives on for eternity. The discovery of witches was taken across to America by the early settlers to the town of Salem in Massachusetts, where it was put to good employment in another reign of terror which is known today as the Salem Witch Trials. Today the legacy of Matthew Hopkins still lives on in the form of his ghosts. Apparently he has been seen at Hopping Bridge, walking along the walls area facing the River Stour. Also ghostly and mysterious screams have been heard coming across from the salt marsh, which is believed to be the spirits of some of his victims. He apparently has been heard inside the Misley Fawn Hotel on the upper floor, walking up and down as a restless spirit perhaps. And lastly, at the White Hart Hotel in Manningtree, where his spirit is allegedly said to haunt. Quite how true any of these stories are, I cannot attest. But I can say that for a long, long time thereafter, the legacy of Matthew Hopkins will live on in this area, perhaps as a vessel to sell tourism, or perhaps for people to come and reminisce over the terrible deeds carried out by two men in the 17th century. And here I finish my documentary and return back to my home. I certainly hope that you've enjoyed this presentation. Until the next time.